everybody. Welcome to Digital Hammurabi. My name is Megan Lewis. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I am very excited to introduce Dr. Willis Monroe, who has very kindly offered to come and do a presentation on Mesopotamian astrology and astronomy, which is wonderful because as I was telling him before we went live, I haven't even looked at this material since I was a first year grad student and I've forgotten it all. So even if you don't enjoy it, I'm going to have a great time. Willis, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Megan. And it's yeah, fascinating stuff that doesn't often get um, doesn't often get explored kind of fully because um, it's kind of very esoteric and very few people do it. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen and get going with the presentation. Absolutely. Here we go. Is that visible? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, so before I get into the presentation, I just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking um, to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, I'm speaking from Vancouver, British Columbia, but I'm going to be talking about um, some really kind of remarkable systems of how ancient people have made meaning. Um, and these come from the texts and minds of, in my case, ancient Mesopotamian scholars, uh, but I, I hope that, that that this lecture, this kind of these slides, and what I'm going to talk about, will inspire you know all of us to recognize the complexity and the ingenuity of indigenous knowledge systems that are around the world, including wherever you're listening from. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So I like to start um, presentations, lectures, slides, whatever talks, just with a little plan to kind of give you some. Um, foreground, kind of where we're going to be going. Uh, so we're going to start with um, some concepts, some astrological concepts, just so we're on the same page. Afterwards, I'm going to cover a very brief, much more could be said, of course, um, a very brief history of Mesopotamian astrology and astronomy. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit of um, theory, and then also, uh, finally, kind of the bulk of the, the talk today at the end is going to kind of investigate this shift um, to what we might call personal astrology and new forms of practice. So something that I, I, I hope you will uh, see some real commonality, some have some familiarity with the idea of horoscopes and how we use the stars to tell, tell us about our personal lives um, and our futures. Um, just, I'm sure that the audience doesn't need any sort of introduction into where, where we are, where we're talking about, but just in case you were wondering, we're talking about southern, um, southern Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, uh, and in particular, a lot of the material that we're going to be covering today, uh, especially in the latter half, uh, comes from the cities of Babylon um, and the city of Uruk uh, in the south. So these are very important cities, especially in the latter half of the first millennium BCE. Um, so to look at some basics of astrology, um, I hope most of us are familiar with the idea of the zodiac uh, and the 12 signs of the zodiac. Um, if you can take away one thing from this uh, talk, it's that the, our signs of the zodiac come directly from Babylonian signs of the zodiac. They are the same thing. Um, and you'll see really cool examples of that later on. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind is that the signs of the zodiac are completely arbitrary. They are divisions of the sky into 12 equal parts, each of which is 30 degree. Um, and they're named after a constellation which is nearby. It might overlap with the sign of the zodiac. It might uh, be totally within side the sign of the zodiac, but they're not, uh, they're not equal to each other. Um, and these 12 signs form a circle around the sky. And this circle, we call it in, in, our, in our modern terms, we call it the ecliptic. It's where the planets and the sun and moon travel. It's the celestial plane. Um, but this is the kind of region of sky where things move. Um, and so ancient observers um, were always kind of interested in what was going on in this part of the sky because a lot of stuff happened. In the other parts of the sky, there are stars. They sit there night by night shining, uh, but they don't really move around. Um, or they move very, very slowly, which wasn't really noticed. Uh, but in this part of the sky, this middle band, um, a lot of stuff happens. There's bright lights whizzing back and forth, stopping, starting, going backwards, etc. And so it attracted a lot of interest, hence um, the kind of eventual um, creation of, of a division of this band into the signs of the zodiac for, for better understanding this. Um, so before I get too into it, I do want to just 
touch on this idea of astrology or astronomy. And so these are uh, these are modern terms that we use to describe ways of looking at the sky. Um, and as modern terms, they have very little bearing on what ancient scholars might have done or might have thought about. Um, the, the emic term, we use this term emic and etic. The emic term is what they themselves called themselves. Etic is what we call them, scholars call them. So the emic term uh, is the tupshar enuma anu enlil. So literally a scribe of enuma anu enlil. And enuma anu enlil is an important text that we'll talk about in a little bit that covers lots and lots of omens, you know, divination about things happening in the sky. But it also includes some astronomy. So it's very clear that whatever these scribes were doing is some combination of these two things. And I came up with this analogy. I'm not sure if it works, so let me know if it helps you. Um, it's kind of like asking an 18th century composer, like, well, do you play the harpsichord or do you conduct musicians? It's one or the other. Um, and a composer might say, well, I do both. Like they are both integral to my to my job as a composer and someone who, who brings a, a piece of music to life, right? I have to uh, instruct my fellow musicians and I have to you know, participate in the music making process. Um, and so Babylonian scribes were, were kind of doing both these things. They were predicting where things appeared in the sky, what we might call astronomy, modeling the, uh, the movement, the, the motion of planets. And, but they were also telling people what that meant. Um, and so I, I've kind of, I like this term astronomology uh, to describe what they were doing to kind of make this portmanteau out of our modern terms. But anyway, they were doing both forms of celestial uh, science. And I, I, I do think it's science. Um, okay, so just to rehash some history, uh, we'll start with Judea, always a good place to start with a, with a cute little guy in black diorite. Um, it's, tracing the earliest history of astrology is a little bit difficult. Um, because there's not a lot of evidence. Um, and what perhaps our earliest um, earliest evidence that we might see for practices about deriving meaning from the heavens is coming from uh, Gudea. And so Gudea was a prolific builder and writer uh, at the end of the third millennium BCE. And in one of his texts, in one of his cylinders, um, he records this long kind of narrative about how he built the temple uh, for his goddess. And it, to determine how to build this temple, he did a number of things that we might call divination. Uh, he fell asleep with the purposes of having a dream um, because we can gain a lot of meaning from dreams. During this dream, he was visited um, by a goddess who showed him a, um, a um, a tablet with stars, with important stars that would instruct him on how to build this temple. Um, and then when he woke up, he sacrificed a goat to check that it was true. And this is a very common paradigm that you you see omens and then you check omens. Um, but in any case, uh, at the end of the third millennium, there was clearly some sense that the stars in the sky could give you insight into what you maybe should do or, or what's going on in the world. Um, so while it's not explicit, you know, astrological omens, there's a clear sense of meaning being derived from the heavens at this point. So we'll skip forward a few hundred years um, into kind of the middle of the second millennium um, and look at the site of Mari on the Euphrates. Here we have a little bit of evidence as well. It's again, quite spotty um, that there's some cataloging of eclipse omens. Eclipses are of course very, um, very ominous. Um, if you've had the, the privilege to see a lunar eclipse or even a solar eclipse, um, they're, they're really quite striking. Um, and so it's not too surprising that, that they were important for understanding the world around you. So in Mari, uh, again, in the middle of the second millennium BCE, we have some eclipse omens that are recorded, um, but not, not, not many of them. Um, and there's really very little other evidence in the, in the rest of the second millennium BC. And this is this is probably more a factor of preservation than anything else. Clearly, the stars had meaning, things in the sky <coughs> had meaning, but they just weren't, weren't either weren't writing it down or we haven't found the tablets yet. Um, so there's obviously much more to, to, to be said about this uh, in, in the future. Um, but the real heyday of Mesopotamian astrology is 
uh, during the reign of the Sargonid kings in the Neo-Syrian Empire, and particularly the kings um, Esarhaddon and Ashurbanipal, and the tablets that were recovered from what, what scholars have often called um, Ashurbanipal's library, although it's a bit of a misnomer. And these are, these are from the city of Nineveh, uh, modern Mosul uh, in northern Iraq, in Kurdistan. Um, and they, there was this extensive recovery of tablets in um, the mid 19th century that ended up mostly in the British Museum. Uh, and really just an amazing amount of information was gleaned from this material. But interestingly, a lot of it concerned divination and in particular celestial divination. Um, and so we have not only the kind of handbooks of um, how astrologers did their craft, we also have tons and tons of letters uh, between the king and his uh, employed scholars. And so th these were scholars who were sent around the empire to observe the sky and report back. Uh, so we have lots of little reports um, and they can be sometimes very, very brief, like the, the moon was spotted, right? Um, because they told time based on um, the, the phases of the moon, they had a lunar calendar. And so knowing uh, when the new moon uh, was going to appear was very important. Um, there's other little things like they, you know, would notice that a planet was in a constellation or something. Uh, so you get these reports of observations from around the empire, including in the capital. Uh, and then you get a lot of interpretation at the same time. Um, so the fact that a planet was in a constellation means something. Um, and it would give the king some, you know, justification for something that he wanted to do um, or an answer to a particular problem he was having. Um, and there's a huge amount of, of material um, that is uh, using these kind of ways of looking at the sky to help run the apparatus of state, right? To help run the Neo-Syrian empire. Um, so it's, it's a very large corpus and it all dates to around the seventh century BCE. So one of those things that I've alluded to already uh, is this text called Enuma Anu Enlil, which is, um, the, the title translates to when Anu and Enlil. It's just the, the first line or beginning of the first line of the text. And it's a series of, you know, roughly 68 to 70 tablets, really depending on which, um, which version you're looking at. It was copied many, many times by many scribes. Um, and some scribes like to add an extra tablet here or there or, or not include one. Um, and generally, uh, it's best preserved in the Neo-Assyrian period, although we have copies, of course, from other periods and other, other locations. Um, it can be divided up into um, the phenomena that are of interest. So the, the, the series um, starts with omens that concern the moon. There's about 22 tablets of those. So the moon being in different places, the sky, the moon being certain colors, the moon being surrounded by halos, the moon being near to other things in the sky, etc. Then you have tablets dealing with the sun. Uh, you have tablets dealing with weather and earthquakes. Uh, it's kind of interesting to think about what kind of conceptual model places earthquakes along with weather. Uh, so that's a fun a fun, intriguing um, puzzle. Um, and then finally, uh, you get tablets that deal with the rest of the planets and the stars. And you know, if you just look at this kind of breakdown of which tablets are uh, kind of, or, or which, which phenomena are covered by more tablets, you'll notice that the moon is really important. Um, and this we shouldn't find too surprising. The moon um, does a lot of stuff in the sky. It, it changes its shape, it gets larger and smaller, it changes its appearance going through phases, it changes its color, it moves a lot, it moves quite fast. Um, and so it's not too surprising that a lot of the omens concern the moon. It's also, the moon is very visible, of course, right? You can see it in the night sky. The sun you can see every day, uh, but it's very hard to tell um, what, is different about the sun day to day um, besides it being cloudy. Uh, it's always very bright and hard to look at. Um, and then interesting to note that the, the all of the planets are lumped into one, um, one group at the end, um, mainly because the planets are, are small bright lights, they move, um, but not too much else changes about them. So uh, to give you a sense of, of a typical report um, that might be sent to the king, um, we have uh, one on the left um, here, it begins with an observation and then has an interpretation. So it says, on the 14th day, the moon and the sun were seen together. This night, the moon was surrounded by a halo and Saturn stood inside the halo with the moon. So the, the scribe has looked at the sky at the night and seen some interesting stuff and wrote it down um, and wrote to the king. And then he, he appends a little interpretation. So he quotes 
um, he quotes an omen from this big omen series, these 70 tablet series, right, which they had on hand, they could refer to. So he says, if on the 14th day, the moon and sun are seen together, so he's quoting an omen, it's always an if then statement, uh, reliable speech, the land will become happy, the gods will remember Akkad favorably, joy among the troops, the cattle of Akkad will lie in the steppe undisturbed. So it's a good thing, right? And it's usually a good thing to report good things to your boss. Um, and so here's a case where he sees something in the sky and says, ah, that reminds me of this omen that I read in this handbook. I'll quote that to the king and send it to him. Um, and hopefully he'll uh, look on me favorably because of course they were employed um, They were employed at the behest of the king, right? So the king can kind of controlled controlled their their fate. In fact, we have some letters where scribes complain about being put out put out of work and and groveling at the king to, to hire them back. Um, on the right, um, the, we have another little letter from a, a, a pretty famous um, scholar who was writing to the king, Isar Shumu Erish. And he says, twice or thrice we watched for Mars today, but we did not see it. It has set. Maybe the king, my lord, will say as follows, is there any sign, ominous sign, in the fact that it has set? I answer, there is not. And these are kind of fun. There's there's quite a few of these letters where scholars are, you know, perhaps pushing back a little bit against the king. Uh, there's one where um, it's it's not um, astrology, but there's one where the scholar sort of says like that, you know, your, your runny nose and sniffling that you're feeling, it's just a common cold. There's nothing wrong with you. Don't worry about it. Like, um, and so these scholars, you know, depending on their, their prominence in the court, they had a little bit of power. Um, and they would sometimes disagree with each other as well. Um, so there are some times where scholars would say like, you know, I heard that so-and-so told you that Venus is up in the sky right now. Well, they're an ignoramus. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, it's not Venus, it's this other planet, which is an interesting point to make because that tells us that these scribes knew something about models of planetary motion, right? They could predict if something was in the sky and they could disagree with each other. And that's something that we often um, characterize as scientific, right? This idea of, of giving out hypotheses and then testing them. Um, and so you can test these through observation, which is really interesting. Um, I wanna make a plug at this point for, um, ORAC, I'm sure it's come up before on this channel. Um, and this is just this amazing resource of um, open access, uh, transliterations and translations of cuneiform texts. Um, so it's the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus. And a lot of the quotations I've given you today from um, various reports and letters in the Neo-Assyrian period uh, can be found on here. And in fact, the two links I have up here um, are the astrological report book, um, so the collection of actual astrological reports, and then also uh, essay 10, which is letters to the king, which is really fascinating. And so I encourage you uh, to just jump on one of these projects and just browse the corpus and read through the letters. I'm um, positive that you'll find something uh, interesting uh, to read. Um, and they're all in translating English, so very easy uh, to look at. Okay. So one question that we often get puzzled, kind of puzzle over with uh, Mesopotamian science broadly, but astronomy and astrology especially, is where's the theory, right? Where's the kind of theoretical um, musing, the, the musing on, on why things are the way they are, um, or, or how are things constructed in the, way, in the way that we find them, or how can we you know, think about them in that way? And this is something that I, I do think there's a way to kind of push back against this a little bit, that our ideas about theory are really derived from kind of Hellenistic or Western oriented systems of, of how we, the, the kind of syntax and semantics of how we talk about theory. Um, and so there is the possibility that we are missing or not quite getting things that might be theoretical in cuneiform texts because they don't match systems of thought that we're used to. So I think we should always keep that in mind. But that being said, I think there's a little bit of, there are some theor kind of theoretical ideas that we can glean from different, different genres of text, right? Not necessarily expressly theoretical text, but different types of text. And so the two things I give here on this slide, one is the prologue to Enuma Anu Elo, this astrological handbook. Um, and the other is the uh, one section from the Enuma Elish, which is um, one of the Babylonian creation myths uh, where Marduk creates the world. You'll see on the, the one on the left, the EAE prologue, um, it's, you know, the gods are creating the world, they lay down the designs of the heaven, they assign the gods to their function, and they created the day, they renewed the month, 
um, and they saw the, the sun in his gate and they made him appear regularly. Um, and so here, there's already this idea that the gods are in the sky, the gods are moving around, they have regular patterns, we can watch for those things, we can understand those. Um, on the right with the Enuma Elish, the creation myth, this is a little bit more, um, a little more, more explicit, but also quite interesting. Um, Marduk in, in creating the heavens does a number of things, um, but he, he sets up the great gods, he sets up the constellations, so the constellations are created, they're, they're in the sky, um, there are patterns of stars, he appoints the year, he marks off his divisions into seasons, etc. Um, and then one of the kind of fun things about this text, and I, I like um, kind of thinking about why how, why we come up with these genres, right? So this is this is a cosmology, it's a creation of the world, but he establishes the phases of the moon and he talks about um, how the phases kind of progress through the month. And then when it gets to the full moon, the text, the again, a piece of mythology, as we would categorize it nowadays, um, it just says, and then it just does the reverse. It goes backwards, right? Because the text is assuming that you have, you know, a somewhat intimate knowledge of how the phases of the moon work. You're, you know, watching the moon night on night. You don't need to be told that it does the reverse, you know, step by step. It understands that you you have some some knowledge of astronomy and how the how the moon works, right? So even inside of, of what we might call myth mythological texts, we get this kind of assumption of of, of astronomical knowledge. So these are two. As I was saying earlier, two genres where we can start to look for theory, perhaps, um, and it's an, it's kind of in, intriguing to think about that. Um, there are some more explicit things. There's a text called the Babylonian Diviner's Manual, which is really fascinating. Um, it's not super popular uh, in the ancient context. Uh, we don't have a ton of copies of it, um, but it does offer us some really interesting things. So. Um, it says that I'm quoting from the text here, the signs on earth, just as those in the sky give us signals, sky and earth both produce portents or omens, uh, though appearing separately, they're not separate because sky and earth are related. So a, si a sign that portends evil in the sky is also evil, evil on earth. One that portends evil on earth is evil in the sky. You get this nice, nice um, kind of parallelism, right? So A is equal to B is equal to A, et cetera. Um, and so I think here we start to see more what we might think of as more explicit theory, right? So if you, if you see something on the earth, you should also be looking in the sky and vice versa. Um, this text also instructs people to kind of study the relevant omens and things like that so they know the material. Um, that's, why, that's why it was given the title Babylonian Diviner's Manual by, um, by its first editors. Um, so there's also some really fascinating new stuff in astronomy. And I, I, I wanna highlight this because, um, you know, as with any um, any area of Assyriology, there's always new information coming out and new things being discovered. Um, and with astronomy, that's uh, no less the case. Um, and so there were, um, as, you know, after the Neo-Assyrian Empire, after this you know, huge collection of observations, reports, and this astrological handbook, there are these major developments uh, in the basically the fifth century onwards, fifth century BCE. So we have the invention of the zodiac, which we're going to cover, um, the the development of horoscopes, so horoscopy, um, and also new forms of astrological literature. I'm going to emphasize that a little bit at the end. Um, but it's important to note at the same time that earlier forms of astrology were always still copied. They didn't throw anything out. Uh, cuneiform scribes are really kind of, um, we might say, conservative in their in their ways of, of working with text. They like to preserve things long term, and so they're still copying EAE. They're still using it, um, but they're also developing these new 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 ideas. And some of these new ideas are really radical. Um, and so I give you here on the right the cover of Science. Um, a well-known science magazine. <laughs> and it has a cuneiform tablet on the cover, probably for the first time, and hopefully not last time. Uh, this is from 2016, I think. And this is a colleague, Matteo Ostendriver, who's really a brilliant uh, brilliant scholar, got a PhD in astrophysics, and then decided to get a PhD in Assyriology afterwards. Um, and he works on this really uh, complex mathematical astronomy, which is really fascinating. And so uh, one of the things that he found was this idea, the scribes seem to be doing some form of proto-calculus uh, on tablets. You know, 2,000 years before Newton, they were calculating the area under a curve to determine the change in velocity for planets in the sky, which is just like mind-blowing, right? It's really cool, uh, really cool stuff. Anyway, so that earned a cover of science. Um, 
very, very cool stuff. And that's, so they were doing that practice, I should say, they were doing that practice sometime around the second, first century BCE, so quite, quite late. Um, okay, so let's, um, let's have a look at the Zodiac. Um, I mentioned earlier that our Zodiac is the Babylonian Zodiac. Um, it was developed probably around the end of the fifth millennium BCE. As I said earlier, it's this division of sky into 12 equal parts, about 30 degrees, well, exactly 30 degrees long. Um, they align perfectly with the lunar months. And Mesopotamia used a lunar calendar. And so the moon is moving through um, all the signs of the zodiac every month, and the sun is moving through one zodiac sign every month. And so you have this really nice uh, connection between sun, moon, and zodiac, and the months, the moon telling time. Um, they derive probably, well, certainly originally from constellations that were also in the ecliptic, and then at some point they sort of decided to um, to reduce that number of constellations and make it just 12 and have each 30 degrees. Um, there, one, one potential reason why they were um, kind of invented, you could say, is that they make it really useful to do astronomical calculation. If you have 12 signs, 360 degrees, you've got lots and lots of factors, you can do all sorts of multiplication, division, etc. cetera. Uh, it makes it much easier to plot the location of planets moving around the sky than having to figure out, okay, I'm, you know, 335 degrees, which constellation am I in? Well, you just know that you're, you know, you divide it by 12 and you take the remainder and that's, you're in that sign plus that remainder degrees, right? It's much easier. Um, the one really important thing to keep in mind, and you can practice this at night, you can't see the zodiac. If you look at the sky, there's nothing in the sky that tells you where the lines of the zodiac are, right? The zodiac is completely invisible. Uh, and this is something that I think we don't often think about, um, but the zodiac is a completely arbitrary division, right? There are no dividing lines in the sky. So to determine where something is, you have to calculate, you have to use math uh, to understand what position something might be in. Uh, so zodiac, Babylonian zodiac, it's very cool. Um, so one of the things that the Zodiac was used for was, as I mentioned, mathematical calculation, uh, but also horoscopes. And so this is, you know, one of the things you may have noticed, or I'll, I'll remind you, when we were talking about um, astrology in the neo Assyrian Empire, it was all about the king and the land. And even the, the reports that scholars were giving were, were really focused on what was going to happen to the king in his daily life, what was going to happen to the land, what was going to happen to enemies of the land, what was going to happen to like the cattle of the land, etc. Right. So it was concerned with these really big things. Um, so in the latter half of the first millennium BCE, and in particular after the invention of the zodiac, you start getting this focus on the everyday, the, the personal. Um, and so there are these small, um, kind of very ephemeral tablets. I, I show a picture of one here. Um, they're, they're quite tiny, um, you know, sometimes not much bigger than a postage stamp. Um, and they concern the, they, they usually record a number of things. They record uh, perhaps the date someone was born. Um, they record sometimes the date and also the configuration of things in the sky. So which zodiac sign each planet was in. Um, and so they'll have either of those things. They very rarely, very rarely have any sort of interpretation. Um, so they're not horoscopes in the way that we think of horoscopes, in that you open your newspaper and it tells you what's going to happen, or you open your app, right? There's, there's some very cool apps I've heard uh, for horoscopes nowadays. Um, but they really just record configurations of the heavens, and they do that because that's quite easy to do initially. You know when someone's born. You can even calculate where things are in the sky. The harder part is then you take that to an astrologer and the astrologer would then pour through their handbooks, their records, and say, okay, given these locations, let me let me formulate a horoscope for you. Let me tell you your fate, right? Or of a child or something. So that was very rarely uh, included on the actual horoscope text. So the texts we have generally just include dates of birth or configurations of the heavens. Um, and it's also important to say that like, um, if they do have interpretations, these are based on earlier earlier texts. Um, so there are some texts earlier on that say, like you know, someone born under a constellation might have this type of um, behavior or might this type of life or something. So it's this new method of thinking about where things are in the sky, coupled with kind of older ways of interpreting uh, material. Just as an aside, um, this is a text that I published a while ago. Um, this is a little birth note, so one of these horoscope texts recording the dates of birth um, for two sisters, one named Apatu and one named 
um, Amat Belitia. Um, and it just has their, their, their father and their dates of birth and their names. Um, but it might be the earliest preserved connection between a personal name and a date of birth. Date, so day, time, month, and year of birth. Um, you know, of course, many people were born before this text uh, and many people after, uh, and many people had names either side of this text, um, but this text might be the earliest time when we actually have someone's name and someone's date of birth together on the same uh, textual object. Um, so very kind of very very cool thing. So this was this is a really good example of this of this genre. Right? This was prepared, uh, probably paid for by uh, by the parents. Um, you know, this was generally something that was relatively elite, um, and it would be held on to. And then if they needed, you know, later on, if they wanted to to tell the their two daughters their fate, they would take it to an astrologer who would who would look at the date, do some calculations, and then give them um, the result. So the other thing that's kind of happening during this period as we're kind of moving into this later, later half of the first millennium BCE um, with the rise of you know, the Zodiac and these horoscopes is you get these new types of handbooks. So I mentioned earlier on in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, there's this big handbook, the Enuma Anu Enlo, right? 70 tablets full of all sorts of things organized by phenomena. Um, you know, you had the moon, you had the sun, you had weather and earthquakes, you had the planets. Uh, in order, um, but we start to get at this point um, new types of handbooks. These little, kind of generally one-offs. There are often often aren't many copies. Numa Anuelo is incredibly prolific. Many many copies from all over the place. These new types of handbooks are generally just single tablets found in different places, and what they do is they they associate traditional forms of knowledge like medicine or um, economic material with the zodiac with astrology. Um, and it's clearly scribes who are kind of playing with this vast wealth of information that they have in Mesopotamia. Tons of omen series, tons of really interesting texts, and these new ways of thinking, these ways of thinking about the sky, those, these ways of schematizing material in the sky. Um, and so the example I give here on the right, this text is about how to predict the price of barley based on the movement of the planets. Um, which is, you know, I'm sure something that every, you know, stockbroker nowadays would love to, you know, have the true record of, you know, whether a stock is going to go up or down based on what's happening in the sky. But cuneiform scribes were really interested in this too. They were really fascinated by, you know, could we actually figure out if barley is going to go up or down based on where planets are? I've got a warehouse full of barley. I want to sell. Should I sell now or should I wait for Mars to move a little bit, right? Um, and so they they have this type of information. But again, these are kind of one-offs. These are explorations into ways of, of associating knowledge. Um, so one of the, the big texts that does this is called the Microzodiac. Um, and this is something that I, I worked a lot on for my dissertation, or basically was my dissertation. Um, and the Microzodiac is interesting because it um, it takes this idea of the zodiac, um, and it does this really cool thing where it, where it squares the zodiac, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and then it constructs this spreadsheet, and you see here a picture of uh, one of the fragmentary tablets. Many are very fragmentary. And if you can just make out on uh, you know on the on the image, there are these columns and rows and cells of text, and this is a spreadsheet. It, it um, the columns all um, are based on signs of the zodiac. Um, so each one, as you move uh, to the right, is a new sign. Uh, and then the rows are different types of knowledge. Um, their medical knowledge, their daily advice, um, their kind of cultic knowledge, their omens, different things. Um, and so they've taken a, a wide collection of traditional knowledge, traditional ideas about how things work, and they've kind of smushed it on top of the Zodiac um, and tried to create this thing that you know, like a, a be all to end all handbook. You know, if I open this up every day, I can see exactly what I need, right? Um, so it's really kind of a reimagining of how astrology works. It's not just this big long handbook of omens. Uh, I, I look at the sky, I figure out what's gonna happen to the king that day. Now I've got this handy thing that tells me kind of everything I need to know day by day uh, based, on the, based on time, based on the zodiac. Um, so this is the scheme that I mentioned, the squaring. So what they've done is they've taken the 12 signs of the zodiac, um, and then within each sign, they've divided 
that sign into 12 more signs based on the same zodiac. And then it kind of rotates through. So you can see there's a diagonal pattern to this uh, table I've put on the right. Right, so the first column of the first tablet is Aries, Aries, and then Aries, Taurus, and then Aries, Gemini, and the first column of the second tablet is Taurus, 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 Gemini, and it wraps all the way around, right? So it's really a cool idea that you've got this circular pattern that you can then kind of square itself and turn into this um, doubly circular pattern, right? It rotates through signs, but then also rotates through subsigns. Um, there's also potentially an interesting uh, correlation here, or at least analogy, with uh, the motion of the sun and moon. I mentioned that the sun moves through a sign every lunar month, and the moon moves through all the signs every month. And so if you look at the, the table, you'll notice that the, the big bolded signs are where the sun is throughout the year, and then the columns, the, the sub-signs, are where the moon is throughout the year, um, within each month, right? So the moon is constantly rotating around. The other really cool thing that um, these tablets have is these really cool images of the zodiac. Um, and so this one in particular is, as you can probably guess, Leo the lion. Um, and he's sitting on the back of Hydra the snake, um, which is very fascinating. And I'll show you in a second why. Um, and then there's some other stuff going on in this little illustration. But it's kind of cool to think of these illustrations as headings on this um, otherwise very complex text. And just below, you can see the, the column headings and the cells of the spreadsheet uh, for Leo. Um, and so you have Leo the lion on top of the hydra. And you notice that the hydra's tail kind of trails off to the right, and then the tablet breaks off. Well, it turns out this tablet um, has another side. Um, and just as a. Uh, as a consequence of, of how these were recovered, they were uh, illicitly looted from Iraq in the kind of late 19th century. Um, this was originally one tablet. You'll see the other, other side in a second. Um, the looters realized uh, correctly for them, unfortunately for us, that uh, a tablet with two images was worth um, less than two tablets, each with one image. And so they snapped it in half and sold one to um, the Louvre in Paris and one to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And so this tablet, which is Virgo, the next sign in the Zodiac, of course, um, is in Paris and this sign is in Berlin, which makes it very hard uh, to study both of them. I've been to see both of them and had to hold up the tablet with my laptop where I took the photo of the other one and try to figure out how they uh, how they fit together. I mean, we know how they fit together, but to see them um, to see them close to each other, which would be nice. So I mentioned the Hydra trailing off on the right. On this one, it's a little hard to see, but on the left-hand side of the image, you'll just be able to make out the end of um, the snake's tail, Hydra's tail. And this is kind of cool because Hydra, the constellation, is actually not in the ecliptic. It's not where the zodiac is. It's a little bit off the ecliptic. And Hydra, as you can probably guess, is a long constellation, hence why it was named the snake or Hydra. Um, and it actually spans both Leo and Virgo in the sky. So if you look at a star chart, Hydra kind of covers both Leo and Virgo. And so we get a nice illustration of that here. And then it is also hard to see, but right at the end of the tail of, of the snake is Corvus the Raven, another constellation in the sky. Um, and he's kind of picking at the snake's tail. So kind of a nice little fanciful um, uh, decoration of, of the zodiac. Um, and I should also just point out that Virgo here is... Um, is a woman ho holding a barley sheaf. Um, and so early on, Virgo in Babylonian was the sheaf of barley, you know, this kind of agricultural symbol. And then eventually she becomes this woman holding this agricultural symbol and then just the woman. So you see this, um, this change in, in the zodiac sign over time. Okay, so a couple other, you know, small examples of the micro zodiac. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, I had to work with. So I have these beautiful big tablets and then little tiny, you know, single cells of the spreadsheet to try to understand and piece together the whole uh, phenomena. So I've already kind of covered a little bit of this, but the contents of the microzodiac were, you know, this this is an example from Leo uh, Libra. So the li Libra column on the Leo tablet, you have this kind of medical ingredients here, right? The Sarvatu tree, the Ar 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 Arariyanu plant, the Amashmu stone, etc. Um, it's the time for a decision of trade. Speech is not very true. The way is not straight. So you should be kind of, you know, wary. Um, if you're wondering which gods to pray to, you can, you know, look at the, you know, it's the opening of the gate of sin, Shamash, Ishtar, Anu, Enlil, Ea, etc. So those are the important ones. And then finally, it says attack of a snake, ditto attack of a scorpion. So 
during this time period, you know, be potentially wary about these um, these types of things happening. And all of these, um, as I mentioned earlier, all of this contents is coming from already established texts. We know, you know, where they're borrowing this material. The kind of innovative thing is now taking these what were disparate collections of texts and sticking them onto the zodiac and making kind of making those things work together. Um, the other interesting um, aspect is I mentioned that these handbooks, these kind of new handbooks that we find in the latter half of the first millennium are usually one-offs. Well, the microzodiac is found in Babylon and in Uruk. It actually exists in two different places. But what's kind of interesting is that they switch the rows of the columns in these two places. You can almost think of it as like different editions of the same book. Uh, the Uruk tablets have these beautiful images. They have the, the rows in a certain way. And then in Babylon, they don't have the images anymore and they've swapped the rows. But the contents are exactly the same. There's like two different, as I said, editions of the exact same book, right? So clearly, clearly the the contents were well known and well understood, um, and then they would kind of play with how to present them in different ways, which is not something that we see a ton uh, in cuneiform texts. There's often many different copies of a text, but they're tweaked in other ways. The contents is different. In this case, the contents exactly parallels parallels each other. So what would you do with this? I mentioned that you could kind of consult it if you wanted to know what to do. Well, we have a little bit of evidence for that. There's this um, small little tablet you see on the left here, and I've made an arrow pointing to the big tablet on the right. Um, the small little tablet says, uh, by the command of Nabu, let it go well, which is a typical opening greeting. Um, so month of Shabbatu, of the house of month Duzu. So this is how they referred to uh, these two, the kind of the overall tablet and the column, okay, the two signs of the zodiac. They're interchangeable with months because they're they're equal to each other. So what it says is the Dupranu stone, Octam plant, Marhalu stone, salve for Nabu Tadanu Utsur, his salve. So what, what this little tiny text demonstrates is that someone referred to the microzodiac or maybe an earlier version of it um, for a particular time based on the um, based on the combination of two months or two zodiac signs, so the, the spreadsheet, and they were able to locate the medical column, the medical cell. And uh, by locating that cell, they were able to extract its contents and create a medical treatment for someone, right? So someone came to an astrologer with a problem uh, of medical, um, a medical problem, and they needed a treatment, and the astrologer was able to use this spreadsheet to find exactly the right treatment for them. Um, so what's kind of going on here is that there's this shift in method, as I've mentioned now a couple times. The contents of these cells, the contents of these handbooks is well known. Um, they are um, understood from earlier texts. They're kind of, they're, they're everyday concerns, right? They're, scribes have been writing about them for quite a while. What is new in this, in this case is that they're attaching them to this kind of schematic representation of the heavens, the zodiac, and creating these kind of paradigmatic ways of looking at the sky and understanding the world around them. There's also really interesting innovations in how these texts are written. Right, this idea of a spreadsheet, the idea of finding location on a spreadsheet for this type of knowledge is, is, is quite innovative for this period. Um, there's also really fascinating diagrams, ways of, of, of thinking about this knowledge in not a linear or textual way, um, kind of in new ways. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind, again, is that there's this continuity in the types of meaning, right? So they're not finding a new way of deriving meaning. Like people were concerned about the price of barley before this as well. Uh, they're just finding a new way to get at that knowledge, and that's by using the zodiac um, and by using these kind of schematized methods. Um, and the focus on the individual is really important as well. Um, so I think um, here's one of the diagrams that I was just uh, just kind of speaking about. One of the, some of the things that we can take away from this, and one of the reasons I like to think of this as closer than you think, right? Astrology in ancient Mesopotamia is that there's naturally this concern. We all share this with the future. Uh, you know, short-term outcomes, long-term prognoses or prospects. Um, and astrology is one way to provide these answers for the unknowable. Um, you can use the signs of the zodiac just as we do today to try to understand or give some comfort to these kind of long, long-ranging questions. Um, and an elite person, you know, when their child was born, they were concerned with what might be happening. They could record the birth, date of birth and know that in the future they could at least... Uh, you know, find out what's gonna to happen to their child. Uh, so a very relevant concern that we all share. Um, 
And then the other thing is that there's, you know, the, these ways of compiling new information. You know, we're always, you know, taking notes, we're reading texts, we're interested in things. We're like, oh, but, you know, I'm trying to combine these two things together. And scribes were really interested in that idea as well. Taking things that they knew from earlier and combining it into new forms that they found more useful. Um, so this um, is, is not for right now. This is a couple months ago, but this was a practical example taken from the microzodiac. So here's some medical ingredients, and this is not medical advice. I'm not a doctor. But this particular text says pomegranate, fennel, myrtle, and serpentine stone. So this, I think, was mid-February. Um, and the advice was um, don't quarrel. It's not going to be favorable. Uh, judgments are not going to be favorable. But a judgment is going to be favorable if you prostrate yourself before Marduk. So think next year, mid-February, this is about what you want uh, for your, your daily advice from the microzodiac. So I'll end it there with a thank you. And I'll just note that this tablet has an image of what the Babylonians saw in the moon. So we think we see a face in the moon. They saw someone uh, fighting a lion. And on the right there, you just see that this is, uh, this is the Taurus tablet. So another one of these beautiful images of the zodiac signs. So thank you. I muted myself. Huh? Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and many different cuneiform objects that I didn't even know existed. So <laughs> I greatly appreciate you expanding my horizons, at least. And I think our, our audience probably agree with me there. Uh, we have some questions. Thank you, everyone who has been uh, bringing up their questions in. Uh, Creo Debunk says, were there any reports about punishing the wrong astrologer? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's so one of the issues with the uh, Neo-Syrian uh, material is that we only have the letters from the scholars to the king. So we know what the astrologers told the king. We don't necessarily know what the king told the astrologers. Um, but I mentioned the, the the scholars kind of groveling for positions. There's very good evidence. Um, it's basically circumstantial evidence, uh, but very secure, of course, that um, astrologers could be fired pretty easily. Uh, you get a couple of predictions wrong and you're out of a job. <laughs> um, and you're, you know, and they really complain very bitterly. They talk about how they're, you know, like a dog eating scraps on the street. They have no money. You know, they need to come back into the court and have um, stable employment. Um, and so, yes, they, they could definitely be, be fired, uh, be let go. Um, in terms of actual punishment, I don't, know of any evidence that we have that they would be like their corporal punishment or something. Mm -hmm. like um, I think it was enough to lose your job and be out on the street. Um, so I'm assuming all of these astrologers are working from essentially the same textbooks. If we're looking at the cuneiform sources that they would have yeah. used to come up with their predictions. So how, how much did their different predictions vary one from another? Yeah, that's a good question. So we don't, the, the issue there is we would have to align specific observations with multiple interpretations. Um, so you have to find something that they all saw, right? Mm -hmm. And then look at what they were actually saying. Um, we don't have too many examples of that, but we do have examples, like I said before, where they disagree. Um, and there are enough of those that we can assume that the scholars you know, did come into conflict with each other and the king about different interpretations. Um, that being said, one of the things that cuneiform scribes are immensely good at is interpreting texts in all sorts of ways and reading different signs, reading different values, turning a bad omen into a good omen by saying, well, it doesn't actually say bad, it really says good, and so it's a good omen. Uh, so they did that too. Um, they were able to take it, take an omen and say, you know, it, it, it says the, the star is red, but that really means it's green and that's good or something, right? Um, that's not a quote, but that's the type of thing. Yeah. That did. And as you were saying earlier, I imagine uh, giving the king a favorable omen was always a better idea than giving him an unfavorable one. Yeah, which brings up the interesting point of um, we have this idea in, sci uh, in science of called um, auxiliary hypotheses. Right, where we say that like I'm doing uh, a lab experiment. I assume that gravity exists. I don't need to test that gravity exists. Like I'm doing, you know, we assume that gravity exists. We assume that my beakers are clean. We assume all these things, right? Cuneiform scribes did the same thing. Um, and so there's always a way to sort of say that like, okay, I made this interpretation, but you know what? This thing I assumed was actually not 
right and was wrong. And that's why it failed. Not because of my interpretation, but because of this auxiliary hypothesis didn't come true. A good example of that is um, the liver, liver diviners in the New Assyrian Empire. They had this standard quotation that they would put in their um, in their rituals that says, you know, please excuse my dirty clothes, excuse my tongue for messing up the language, excuse the sheep from being unclean, right? All these kind of caveats to say, okay, at the end of this, all these caveats, I'm going to look at the liver and I'm going to tell you what it says. But, you know, with the kind of aside that like, well, if I'm wrong, it's probably that you didn't like that I had dirty clothes, meaning mm -hmm. the God, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was wrong. Not because I read the liver wrong, but because my, you know, turns out you were angry that day and my clothes were not clean enough. Um, and so there's always this way out, right? There's mm -hmm. this way of saying it's not actually what happened. Thank you. Uh, Donald asks, can you compare the astrologers in the ancient Near East to professional prophets in Judah and Israel? They sound like they fulfill similar roles. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, right? This idea of having these um, these learned people who advise the king. Um, so I'd say I'd say there is a lot of similarity. I think what you're seeing in the ancient Near East is a little bit more of an apparatus behind them, right? So a system of a system of training, uh, schooling. We we know exactly how these scribes. Um, went through their schooling, where they started. They started making vertical wedges on clay tablets and went all the way up to um, make, creating copies of the Numa Anu Enlil for their, uh, for their teachers. Um, and then this idea of the apparatus of the court and understanding how they were employed and how they worked with colleagues, et cetera. So I'd say there, there's a lot of similarity in the kind of functional aspect of how they advise a king, uh, especially advising, advising the king in kind of divine or supernatural matters, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the gods thinking um, about what you're doing? Um, but the apparatus behind how they become, in, they, how they get into that role is quite different. Uh, so it's the same kind of functional aspect, but but the creation of that role is a little bit different. But good question. Thank you very much. Um, Big Zebra says, is there evidence of a poetic effort when you're writing something like the Diviner's Manual? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, poetry. So poetry, yeah, poetry in Akkadian is, is hard. <laughs> um, so, so Diviner's Manual, whether there's poetry in the Diviner's Manual. I think there we would struggle a little bit to understand too much poetry. I mean, poetry is a construct, of course. Too much poetry in the Dorian's Manual. I would say the place where you're going to have this kind of eliding of the genres more, and this is kind of what I hinted at, was um, things like the Enuma Elish, right? The the, the cre uh, creation epic, and and there the astronomical knowledge is kind of embedded in this very poetic language. Um, so I think that is that's cases where you can find this kind of um, aspects of of poetic language alongside what we could call scientific knowledge at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the diviner's manual is much more didactic, I would say, than it, than it is uh, poetic. And actually, uh, the immediate next question is very much related to that. Um, are there interpretations that make reference to places or characters from things like the Gilgamesh epic, or I'm going to mm. add uh, Enuma Elish? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there, there was a lot of celestial omens out there, so I, mm. I don't want to be wrong about this. I don't think that there are any that make mention of Gilgamesh. There are these historical omens and they're they're made they were made very famous because they've been used to kind of understand chronology a little bit better, but they're maybe not so useful for that anymore. There's these no omens called the um, Venus. It's called the Venus Tablet of Amitsutuka. So there are these Venus omens, so o celestial omens about the planet Venus and its appearance and movement that um, reference a historical but maybe slightly mythological old Babylonian king Amitsutuka. And these omens are found in the first one in BCE. And when people first discovered this tablet, they got very excited because these Venus, these, these omens about Venus, so if Venus is in a certain place, it means this. The collection of the if statements could be thought of as observations. So if Venus is in a certain star, okay, the next one says it's in another, you know, whether or not these are actual observations or not, they represent locations of Venus in the sky. And if you have locations of Venus, you can use modern methods to predict when those locations would, would have happened in mm -hmm. the past. 
And so a lot of work was done to sort of say like, okay, well, if these reference a historical semi-mythological King Amitsutuka, then these omens must date to a certain time, even though they're copied, even though the text is from the first millennium, it gives us a precise astronomical dating for when Amitsutuka was in reign. That I think has fallen out a little bit of favor because scribes could say that this is an omen of whoever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, we, we don't have any evidence that these are directly from the reign of Amitsutuka. So, so that's kind of related to the question in that I'm not sure that there are any about Gilgamesh, but even if there were, it doesn't necessarily establish that these the observation of the celestial phenomena took place during the reign of Gilgamesh, right? a mm -hmm. historical Gilgamesh, for instance. Um, all that they would tell us is that the scribe who wrote the omen was familiar with Gilgamesh as a figure mm -hmm. um, and maybe wanted to construct this kind of um, antique omen or something like that. And uh, again, related, someone asked previously, uh, is looking at the, the different signs of the zodiac, is the bull of heaven, like, like the literary figure of the bull of heaven that we see in Gilgamesh and, and other mythology, is that correlated to the Taurus zodiac? Sign? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so in terms of the figure, right, the figure of the bull of heaven, it is Taurus. Um, so there's a constellation in the sky that's known as the bull of heaven. Later on, it becomes the zodiac sign Taurus. So, you know, in that sense, yes, but in the same sense that Venus, the planet is Ishtar, right? And Ishtar mm -hmm. appears in Gilgamesh as well. Um, so, you know, the celestial sphere was incredibly rich in its imagery. There's all these people, you know, gods and things happening um, and they're used in astrology a lot because the, the names are the same. Uh, and to some idea that the conceptions are the same, right? So Venus appears, you think of it not just as Venus, but also as Ishtar. Lovely, thank you. Um, and when we were looking at the the little horoscopes that you showed us, uh, Ray was asking how accurate is the dating in a pre-Julian calendar? Yeah, good question. So, so we have, so again, this kind of relates to what I was just saying about astronomical um, events. One of the things that we can do is take observations in the past. For instance, eclipses are a really good example. Um, and we can say, okay, an eclipse happened and it happened with a particular planet in a zodiac sign. And we can then uh, look back through eclipse records, um, especially computed eclipse records using, you know, like NASA has an eclipse calculator on their website that you can use to figure out when eclipses eclipses have happened in the past. And you can say, okay, well, there's there were like three eclipses in this century, and this planet was in a zodiac sign at this time. So, you know, this observation has to date from this particular point in time using our calendar, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, there's many ways to calculate days, months, and years that people have used around the world. If you're using our modern uh, system of calculation, you can figure out exactly when an eclipse happened based on our calendar. And then what you can do, and this is why it's so interesting for chronology, is you can say, okay, was that observation, did the scribe date it, right? They say this was year 10, month five of, you know, Alexander the Great, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and then if they did, you can say, okay, well, this precise time using our modern calculation, our modern time keeping system, dates to uh, this particular time in uh, the Seleucid calendar or something, right? So, so astronomical observations are incredibly important for chronology. Thank you very much. Um, do we know of earlier attempts to predict economic information using an earlier form of divination before it was tied to the zodiac? Yeah, so I, I reference this a little bit. There are tablets that kind of hint at ways of thinking about price changes and stuff like that. Um, you know, this gets at kind of whether there is a empirical basis for this type of thing, right? So if you were a barley farmer in Mesopotamia, you can probably predict that like barley prices are pretty low right around the harvest and pretty high at the opposite point of the, or right before the harvest or, you know, whatever. Um, so there is an empirical basis for understanding shifts in barley prices. Um, what's kind and, and, and they kind of made omens about this type of stuff. Um, what's kind of interesting is what, what we get in the latter half of the first millennium is these astronomical diaries where they're keeping track of observations every day, every month, they track everything in the sky. They also record prices of commodities and river levels and historical events. And, uh, these diaries are fascinating and there's a project on ORAC, the, um, that translates a lot of them. So if you're mm -hmm. curious, you can check them out. One idea behind why they were calculating all this information was they were using this for prediction, 
of things in the sky, right? If you if you if you have you know a hundred years of records of where Jupiter is, it's really easy to figure out where Jupiter is next month because you just look back uh, one cycle and you can figure out exactly where it is. But also, you could use it for prediction of, of of river levels and prices, right? So they were kind of constructing these these models of data uh, to understand future events, and they weren't just interested in the sky; they were interested in the world around them. So recording historical events, right? Something bad happens in the land. You know, they can try to start to think, okay, well, is that going to happen again? We have records going back a hundred years. Let's see if you know we see it come around again. You know, of course, they weren't successful in predicting cycles of history, <laughs> but uh, but they were quite successful with astronomical things because those are very cyclical. Um, but for the commodities and stuff like that, yeah, they were very interested. You know, of course, there was economic concern, mm -hmm. uh, and there were lots of omens to deal with that as well. Thank you very much. Um, so Mark is asking if there is. Oh, any way that they can read your dissertation or related publications? Yeah, there is. So I would suggest um, there's a really good book by Francesca Roshberg called Heavenly Writing. Um, that's a great place to start if you're interested in Babylonian astrology and astronomy. Um, it's very accessible. I think it's relatively cheap. So I'd recommend that. Um, I wrote an article, a very sh kind of short article, overviewing Mesopotamian astrology for this journal called Religion Compass. Um, so if you can get your hands on that or email me, um, I can send you a copy. I'd be happy to. Um, and my dissertation is available somewhere on the web. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it, it, it is open. Part of the mm -hmm. dissertation is, is opening it up. Um, so it's it's downloadable. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm turning it into a book right now. Uh, that'll be a better read. Um, so. But I would start, if, if, if you want to start somewhere, I'd start with Francesca Rochberg's Heavenly Writing. It's a really good book and highly recommended. I second that. It's a wonderful book. Yeah. Um, so, Koro Koro, um, how would the horoscope texts, the, the small ones, have been uh, used? Would they be simply used for a reference for a particular person, or do you like, give it to that person to hold on through their life? Yeah, it's a good question. So, the idea is, the model is, we don't, of course, we don't have any texts that tell us why they wrote these, right? The model is that a parent would have this written soon after their child was born, before they forgot the date of birth, uh, for instance. Um, and then they would keep that. And presumably, at some point, they would give it to an astrologer um, to have the horoscope actually interpreted. Um, we have one really interesting example of this, where there is a horoscope for someone known, named Anu Belshinu, who's a well-known figure in the Hellenistic period. It records. This is one of the few ones that actually has the interpretation on it. It records the date of his birth and the configuration of the heavens and a few things. He's going to have a long life, have some sons, etc. It seems like Anu Belshinu himself wrote his own horoscope later in life. He was a very good astronomer and astrologer. We know because he signed lots of really excellent texts uh, that we have. And it is highly probable that later in life, kind of as a folly, he used all the text that he'd written, these calculations, these tables, et cetera, to compute back to his date of birth, figure out the configuration of the heavens, and interpret his own life uh, for himself. And of course, he was right. He had a long life. He had sons, et cetera. Right. This was after all of that. Um, and so generally, they were done at the time, of course. But we have this one cool example of someone just doing it for themselves because they thought it would be fun. Just just for fun. That's yeah. that's really, really cool. Um, uh, Koro Koro again, do we have any ancient commentaries to zodiacal texts? Yeah, there are commentaries. I mentioned, um, I mentioned this idea that scribes could reinterpret uh, omens. And so this is a very common thing that scribes do, these commentary texts where they take a list of omens and they say, okay, I'm going to, you know, this word actually means this word, or I'm going to explain it in this way. So we have quite a few texts where they're uh, taking astrological omens uh, and reinterpreting, right? So they might say, um, you know, the the original omen might say, I think this is, this is somewhat closer to a quote. I don't have it off the top of my head, but but this one might exist. You know, the original omen might say when the particular planet is black, well, black means to be well, which means to be good, and therefore this is a good omen, right? Originally it was a bad omen, but we're reinterpreting the word black, right? So the, the commentary will actually spell all of this out. We'll show you how to get from the bad omen to the good omen. So we do have quite a few commentary texts that, that do that type of process. 
Excellent. We have about two more questions and then we are going to let Dr. Mongro go and enjoy the rest of his Saturday afternoon. Uh, what exactly is the relationship between the 12 months of the Neporian calendar from the time of Lugal Zagezi to the 12 astrological signs of a later period? Yeah, good question. So they're, they're clearly quite closely related. You have the 12 months, right? And this is because in Mesopotamia, they always, uh, they generally always used a lunar calendar. So it's very easy to tell time based on the phases of the moon. You just watch and you see. Um, and so the new moon was based on, so the new month, the new month was based on the appearance of the new moon. So when you first saw the crescent appear above the horizon after sunset, that was your new month. Um, this is exactly how the Islamic calendar still works today. Um, and so uh, you have this 12 month system that was based on the moon from very early on. Um, interestingly, the, a lunar month is 28 or 29 days, um, depending on lots of factors in the sky. Um, and what they do later on, actually somewhat earlier as well, um, it's very hard to calculate things um, if you constantly have to remember if the month is 28 or 29 days. Um, and so one of the things that they do um, is they create this kind of ideal calendar where a calendar is every month is 30 days. And so especially if you're calculating things like interest on loans, you know, celestial things obviously, but you know, things that involve calculations across multiple months, you use the ideal calendar. You don't try to say like, okay, well that month only had 28 days, so we'll subtract one from the result or you know whatever. Um, so they use this ideal ca calendar pretty pretty early on. And so when they invent the zodiac, the idea there is that you're just taking the the, the night sky divided into 12 because there are 12 months, there are 12 kind of lunar uh, systems, 12 repetitions of the lunar phases um, in a year, and then you have this easy one to one uh, correlation. So they yeah, it's based on all based on the moon, basically. Lovely, thank you. And finally, Lexi Henning, who is the wonderful hostess of the Osmandias Project, fantastic pod, uh, podcast, go and check them out, says, uh, were there any Mesopotamian monuments or buildings that were built astronomically orientated, uh, oriented, like the pyramids on the Giza complex mm -hmm. were built to match the Orion constellation? Yeah, that is a good question. As far as I'm aware, no. Um, we there, There's some... There's some evidence there's, or a suggestion that like the a lot of Mesopotamian temples are in this diagonal configuration with the um, uh, with like north, south, east, west, stuff like that. Um, there's none that I know of that have any connection to particular constellations in the sky. Um, the kind of I think the the supposition about their orientation might have more to do with uh, providing shade and not direct sun. Uh, it's very hot in southern Mesopotamia, as it is in Egypt as well. Uh, but having this kind of diagonal configuration with the rising sun, you don't get any, um, you don't get sun hitting the kind of flat end of a building, you know, really warming it up. It's always these oblique angles or something like mm -hmm. that. So that's maybe one idea. So that is astronomical in a sense. Uh, but no nothing that I know of that is attached to uh, night constellations that you would see at night, for instance. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, thank you all for sticking around. Uh, Dr. Monroe, thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, glad to, glad to provide it. It was really fun. Um, uh, we are going to head out now. If you are a regular viewer, please remember that we're going to start our HAPS interviews um, probably the week after next. If you are not a regular viewer, watch the HAPS interviews because they're super awesome and you get to hear about PhD students' current research projects. Um, so there'll be more information on that coming soon and keep an eye on our calendar on the website, which is digitalhammurabi.com forward slash calendar. I'll post all of the interviews there so you can come uh, and support all of the students. And until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Bye, guys. Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.